You were made to count, to have an impact, to change the lives of people, to make the world a different place because you're in it. And God placed that desire deep in our hearts. And I want to invite you today to do that around one single word, not a hard word to guess, but I'll take a little while before we get there. I want to start by uh, offering two cheers for mental health. And you might wonder why two and not three. There's a lot of conversation about mental health in our day. We talk about it more than ever before. There's a remarkable essay about it. It was in the New York Times by a clinical psychologist, Hugh Green. And he says, this discussion of mental health issues in our day is a very good thing to destigmatize it, to make resources more available to people, to make people feel less ashamed about all of us bringing into the light our pain and our struggles with depression or anxiety or psychosis or obsessive compulsive or bipolar disorder. That is such a good thing. And so often we have not done that well. So often in the church, we haven't done that well, or we've implied to people, if you just have enough faith and you believe the right stuff and you're not sinning, then that should take care of all of your needs. And it doesn't take care of all your needs. So he says, it's a very good thing that we're talking about that more. And um, we want to keep doing that. And at the same time, he says, when mental health becomes the only category by which we look at life, something begins to shrink and shrivel inside of us because we're made for something more than just a pleasant emotional experience in life. Mental health ends up being a terribly vague word. Physical health is relatively clear because it's mostly biology. And if cancer cells are present or arteries are getting clogged or neurons aren't working right, that's a fairly scientific issue. What does mental health consist of? If somebody sins, if somebody lies, if somebody steals or gossips or envies, are they suffering from a problem in mental health? See, one of the difficulties is when we move to talking about uh, what life ought to be like, we begin we inevitably to talk about ethics. Robert Roberts, a philosopher, says that positive psychology is really simply a combination of psychology and ethics. We can't get away from that. That question, how do you become a good person, is inescapable. And in our day, increasingly, the answer to it is therapy. But Green, who is a clinical uh, psychologist and recommends therapy for folks quite highly, also recognizes the fact that it is not the answer to every problem in life. And of course, financially, it's not available to every person. And uh, he talks about uh, the experience of one guy in particular uh, here's what he writes. Um, the shift towards prioritizing mental health might be benign if it were only one way of reframing the question of what our priority should be. Who is a good person? How do you become one? But it comes with the imprimatur of clinical authority. As a result, therapists increasingly stray into a broader ethical arena while appearing to remain within their own zone of expertise. During an inpatient hospitalization, the writer James Mumford took part in a form of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. It's very powerful therapy. I like a lot of aspects of it. It involves accepting the reality of my inner experience, owning and not enthroning, and then committing to values. The idea is we can create a more meaningful life if we focus on what's important to us. Perhaps, but Dr. Mumford, an ethicist, observed that his therapist seemed to slide too readily into implying that values are entirely subjective, that there are no moral facts. This is a theoretically substantive claim, one that is controversial among philosophers. Dr. Mumford tried to engage the therapist in discussion, but was brushed off. Here was a situation in which mental health expertise came into conflict with philosophical reflection, let alone spiritual or moral reality. See, to that question, uh, what does mental health look like? The answer in scripture would be shalom. It is a reflection of shalom. There is a way the mind is supposed to be. I am supposed to believe uh, thoughts and ideas that are true. I am supposed to desire that which is noble, uh, uh, noble and beneficial to other people. 
And um, when my mind falls short of that shalom, then my life will not be what God wants it to be and will not be the benefit for other people that they need to have from me. It's interesting that in the ancient world, the Stoics were in many ways people who prioritized mental health or emotional experience above all. Folks who write about this will say, at the core of Stoicism was the idea that you can control or master your inner life, your thoughts and your feelings, and that you want to arrange your inner life so that no matter what circumstances happen to you, nothing is able to disrupt your experience of serenity. However, when Jesus came, he did not call us to place the pursuit of mental health or the absence of mental suffering at the core of our lives. That comes in a single word, and that word is love. And that's why you can't, kind of like you cannot achieve happiness if happiness is your primary goal. Happiness comes as a byproduct of a certain way of life, of a meaningful life. And the same thing is true of mental health. The pursuit of just mental health, a pleasant mental experience, can be a quite self-centered pursuit. And we're called for something more. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 has haunted the human race for 2,000 years now. And Paul doesn't write, though I speak in the tongues of men and the angels, but have not mental health, I am nothing. Now remain faith, hope, and mental health. These three, but the greatest is, no, the greatest is love. And to love will inevitably mean to suffer. Part of what Hugh Green writes about in his very thoughtful essay is, there will be times when we are called to engage that in which mental health considerations alone would prevent us from doing, where we will enter into pain and suffering because that is our calling. I'm not sure that anybody ever wrote about this uh, with greater beauty than C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. And he talks about how tempting it can be to try to arrange my life around having a pleasant emotional experience, avoiding internal suffering. And how that sense of inner serenity is what the most noble pagans, the Stoics, often were after. But here's what he writes. There is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is, to, is damnation. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. Amazing words. I believe that the most lawless and inordinate loves are less contrary to God's will than a self-invited and self-protective lovelessness. The idolization of a safe and protected, suffering-free mental experience. It's like hiding the talent in a napkin, and for much the same reason, I knew that thou wert a hard man. Christ did not teach and suffer that we might become, even in the natural loves, more careful of our own happiness. If a man is not uncalculating towards the earthly beloveds whom he has seen, he is none the more likely to be so towards God whom he has not seen. We shall draw nearer to God, not by trying to avoid the sufferings inherent in all loves, but by accepting them and offering them to him, throwing away all defensive armor. If our hearts need to be broken, and if he chooses this as the way in which they should break, so be it. So the word today is love. I think of so many of you that I know whose hearts have been broken. I think of one who has loved an institution dearly and devoted so much to it and suffered disappointment. I think of parents who had to say goodbye to a child and it is unnatural and uh, an earthquake to the soul. 
I think of a woman who loved the church and sacrificed so much to try to help it come into the light and into wholeness and experience so much difficulty as a result of that. I think of a young person I know who has had a dream that he has cherished now for a bit over a decade, and it just seems to be dashed and disappointed. Keep loving. Keep loving. It hurts. Keep loving. Offer that love to God and allow it to flow. Allow it to flow in words. Allow it to flow in gifts. Allow it to flow in time. Allow it to flow in acts of service. Today, ask God for a heart of love. It may be a broken heart because there is no place where you can make a heart of love safe from pain. But we are the fellowship of the withered hand. And it is by having hearts that are broken that we find each other on common ground and meet our Savior at the foot of the cross and experience community together that is far deeper than community that is built on shared, pleasant, emotional experiences. Love. Let your heart be broken in love. That is the way that life counts. I love you. Thanks for joining us here at becomenew.me. If you'd like to receive the daily emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Or if you want prayer, you can text us at 855-888-0444.